Good morning, church. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm glad to see all of you here this morning. I came from Brazil yesterday. I was a bit scared not to be here this morning, but praise the Lord, I'm here. So we welcomed each one of you. I'd like to welcome our church fellows who are watching us from our YouTube channel and from the VOER radio station. Be the presence of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit be with all of you this morning and warm the heart of every one of us this morning. I'm delighted to present our platform party today, right? Uh, praise time, Sister Alice Brown, scripture reading. I try to pronounce your name correctly. Theophily. Quitting Jirimana. Wonderful. Offering called Janice Fagilan, uh, children's feature, it's gonna be on video today, right? So you don't need to come in front today. So pastoral prayer, sermon, and benediction, Bob Hill, and special music, Alice Brown. My name is Edmar Rodriguez, so I'm delighted to be in charge of this platform party today. So in the call to worship today, I'd like to read Romans chapter 5, verse 1 to 5. It says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into, his, into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patient experience, and experience hope. And hope make not ashamed, but the love of God is shared abroad in our heart, by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we are delighted to be here in front of your presence, in the house you prepare to meet each one of you. We thank you for the blessings you have provided you know, throughout this week, being it material, emotional, and especially the spiritual blessing of salvation. Forgive the sins of every one of us this morning and help each one of us to look into forward the things that really matter on earth, which is our salvation. We humbly claim the presence of your Holy Spirit throughout this worship service. Speak directly to the heart of every one of us and teach us to live the life that honors only you. We ask in the Jesus' name, amen. Now, I'd like to just to invite praise time. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It's wonderful to be in Father's house this morning, and it's always Beautiful to be here to sing his praise, and we offer up our voices of praise unto him this morning. And we're going to start with hymn number 469, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Oh, oh, oh. 
but I can tell you those arms are pretty solid and strong. We're going to change the tempo a little bit, but not much. Um, this next hymn that we're going to sing, I remember as a little girl hearing my mom singing this one morning as she was going around doing her housework. And uh, it's kind of stuck with me over the years. It's number 369, Bringing in the Sheaves. And that's what we're going to sing, number 369. Trust we all know what sheaves are. That's bringing people in. People are the sheaves, bringing them in to Christ. And as we go through the gates of heaven, we bring them with us. And that can be a wonderful day. Our opening hymn now this morning is number 466, Wonderful Peace, and we'll stand as we sing. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Good morning, church. We open our Bible and read our scripture reading. We turn in Isaiah chapter 61, version, verse, uh, verses 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath now anointed me to preach good tidings into the meek. He hath sent me to, to bind up the broken hearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Amen. Good morning and have a Sabbath, everyone. For our offering this morning is for local church budget. You have at, at your control the power to increase or decrease your love for God. The same you can be said about the love for this church. You have the power to increase or decrease your love for it. How? Jesus stated it, it plainly in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. When your treasure is... There's, there's your heart will be also. Here's how the Amplified Bible explain it. Where your treasure is, there's your heart, your wish, your desire, that is which your life center will be also. Let me explain in this way. God has set things up, up so that your heart will follow whatever you make your invest. If you neglect your family, friends, your love for them will diminish. If you invest more time, and money with them, your love for them will grow. The same, this true is with your love for God and his church. Your love for God and his church increase as you place your treasure, your money, time, skills, and service with God and his church. I can testify today that it's worked this way for me. How about you? The amount of time you spend at work or school or a hobby or, even, or virtually anything in fact how important that is to you. Your heart follow where, where you place your treasure. Today, I'm inviting you to increase your love for God and, he, and for his church. And you can also simply by giving at this time. Let's pray. Our gracious can and heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for your love. We thank you for this beautiful, uh, for this Sabbath day that you have given unto us to, to come and to worship with you. May your love will increase to us, dear Lord, so that more blessings, more tithes and offerings that we'll bring to, to offer you, and also not only for that, and also for our skills, our talents, to bring more people to the church. Dear Heavenly Father, may, you, may your love will be increased to us also so that we can be more meaningful to other and we can be uh, blessings to every one of us. Dear Heavenly Father, this is all we pray in the loving of Jesus. Amen.
Bobby, this one's for you. And what about me? Um... What's the matter, Gumbo? Freckles loves Tubby more than she loves me. She hates me. You didn't get a lollipop for Gumbo? Um, I got only two. I gave one to Tubby and kept one for myself. I see. Let me tell you the story of Emily. There lived a young girl called Carol. She was six years old and a very popular girl in school. She was friendly and sweet and everyone wanted to be friends with her. One day, a new girl called Emily came into Carol's class. She was a quiet and shy little girl. She went and sat all by herself in the last row. Carol, who was sitting in the front row, turned back at Emily and smiled to make her feel comfortable. Emily smiled back at her, a little hesitant. The teacher entered the class and began teaching. Soon, the bell rang and it was lunch break. All the children got up and ran out into the garden to play, except Emily. Carol was about to leave the classroom and she looked back and saw Emily sitting all alone, looking out of the window. Carol went up to her and said, Hey, why don't you come and join us? It's fun during the breaks. We all play together. Come. Emily didn't know if she really wanted to go out and play with the others. She was feeling very shy in her new school. But Carol would not leave her alone. She pulled Emily by her hand and ran out of the classroom. She took her out into the garden and brought her to her other friends. Look, we have a new friend. Everyone, meet Emily. Emily, these are my friends. Emily smiled shyly. There was one boy in the group who did not smile back at Emily. He said, No, I'm not going to play with her. I am not playing if she is playing with us. Saying this, he stomped off. Emily started crying and she ran away from everyone. Carol was angry with Tim for his rude behavior. So she made a plan and discussed it with her other friends. Next day, after class, Carol went out to play with her friends. They took Emily with them too. But this time, they did not take Tim along with them. Tim sat all by himself and watched everyone playing together and having fun. He felt really bad. He thought to himself, That's okay. They'll want me to play with them tomorrow. The next day, the same thing happened. Emily, Carol, and all of their other friends were playing together. This time, too, without Tim. Tim was very angry with Carol for leaving him out. He walked up to all of them and said, How can you all start playing without me? Now, do you realize how Emily must have felt? when you chose not to play with her? Tim realized his fault. He apologized to Emily and they all started playing together happily. So, it is never a good feeling if people don't choose you. We should always love everyone the same way. I am sorry, Gumbo. I didn't want to hurt you. You can take mine for now. And I promise to get you another one the next time. Take mine, Gumbo. We're really very sorry. Take both the lollipops. <laughs> that was a nice moral story, wasn't it? Hope you liked it. We'll be back soon. Bye-bye. You, each one of you to sing with, him, with me hymn 671 now dear Lord as you pray and after that you know, Bob will lead us a word of prayer
our loving Father in heaven. Most holy is your name. You are worthy of all honor, glory, and praise. With a word, you created the universe, and you alone guide it in its course. We submit ourselves to you, Father, as we seek refuge from the world in your Sabbath rest today. We try, Lord, to direct our eyes towards heaven each day and fall a little short, sometimes distracted by the pace and direction of this world. We seek your mercy and your understanding. Give us the courage to be still, to know that you are our God, to hear your voice amidst the noise and to faithfully follow you. Teach us to be open to your Holy Spirit. Show us how we are to follow the Lamb, your Son, Jesus, wherever he goes, and to do so boldly with unyielding faith. Be with us today, Lord, as we seek you and long to personally and collectively encounter you as we come together in worship. We are in your loving hands, Father, and trust in your divine guidance and peace. Bless those who are struggling with illness, whether physical, emotional, or spiritual, and help them, Lord, find comfort, patience, and peace. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 to 3 is my favorite verse of all the Bible. And it reads, But now thus says the Lord, o cre who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, neither shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. This particular hymn I've chosen for this morning was one of my dad's favorites. And he always liked it sung a cappella, which means without music. And I'm singing it today in memory of him because 29 years ago on August 16th, which was this past Wednesday, he was laid to rest. And many, some of you may remember, no, Heather, you remember Ruby, Roz, um, Ursula, and um, he loved God so, so much. And it's been a heavy week for me this past week. There's a lot been happening. But no matter what we go through, God leads us along. He's there with us. And even though we can't see him, he's there with us. And sometimes he doesn't send his angels. He comes himself at certain times. And this is an old, old hymn. Maybe some of you know it. I, I don't know. But it says, In shady green pastures so rich and so sweet, God leads his still children along. So this is in memory of my dad this morning. And I pray that you will be blessed as I sing this. In shady green pastures, so rich and so sweet, God leads his dear children along. Where the water's cool flow bathes the weary one's feet, God leads his dear children along. Sometimes on the mountain, 
mount where the sun shines so bright. God leads his dear children along. Sometimes in the valley, in the darkest of night, God leads his dear children along. Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through his blood. Some through great sorrow, by God gives a song. In the night season and all the day long, those sorrows befall us and Satan oppose. God leads his dear children along. Through grace we can conquer, defeat all our foes. God leads his dear children along. Away from the mud and away from the scarf clay, God leads his dear children along. Away up in glory, eternity stay. God leads his dear children along. Some through the waters and some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through his blood. Some through great sorrow by God gives the song. In the night season and all the day long. Happy Sabbath, everybody. I'm just going to get set up here now.
the signal. Should be projecting, but we're not. Right? Do you know that? Yeah. Since you you were both using this, so I don't know. Yeah, it should be projecting. I'd like to have the slides if that's possible. Yeah. It's on. It's working. All right, sorry about that. I think it might be easier to give the slides ahead of time and then have, have the man who knows what he's doing load them. Anyway, here I am, here we are. Welcome, happy Sabbath, and uh, I wanna thank everybody. That was a beautiful song, Alice, a truly touching, special music, and it's calming, gets, gets me ready, and I don't get up and, and uh, preach every day. And I wanna thank uh, Catherine, for a well done Sabbath school, uh, also for Edmar for leading us out uh, on our call to worship. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, Theo, for reading the uh, from Isaiah 61:1, and Janice for the offering call to the deacons for for collecting the offering, which keeps our church going. And thank you for for contributing. Um, the music today was was beautiful, uh, Alina. Alina, thank you. Great addition to our church, awesome addition, thank you. And I wanna thank everybody uh, for joining us today, either in person or whether you're on YouTube or Zoom, thank you, um, we appreciate it. So while preparing for the sermon this morning, I re was reminded of my father, my dad. Uh, he and I were on our way home uh, one supper evening from his work, so I would go from school, walk to, you know, about a half a kilometer or so, get to his work, and, we would go home at about six o'clock, and by then I was usually pretty hungry. And I recall that particular night I was starving. And he began to recite the Beatitudes. He was a devout Christian man, and so he, he was driving along. Blessed are the poor, the mournful, the meek, etc. And he asked, do you know the Beatitudes? And I really, I was 10 at the time, so I had heard of them, probably learned them at some point but didn't know them really well. And he said, well, do you know any one of them? And I, I was so hungry. I said, well, blessed, blessed are the, those that hunger. And that was a good, I remembered that one. And so that worked out great. And, uh, you know, in retrospect, he probably brought them up because I wasn't patient while we were waiting to go home. I think that's probably where that came from. If you're trying to teach me a lesson, my father was like that. He wasn't confrontational. He was a beautiful man. Well, anyway, flash forward to today, and I, I know them a little better. That's what we're going to have our sermon on today. And we'll work through them here today, one at a time, with some comments 
um, mixed in. Hopefully we'll, we'll come to some understanding about them. So there are traditionally nine Beatitudes from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Now some pastors, when you, when you hear them preach, will talk on eight. And I think this is because eighth and ninth are quite similar. They have to do with persecution. Um, but one's in the third and one's in the second person. They're different, and we'll see that. Um, but they're similar enough, I guess, that they combine them. So um, we'll walk through them tonight and nail down what it is Jesus was trying to tell us. Or today, sorry, not tonight. All right, so I think a good place to start would be to read from Matthew uh, 5, verses 1 through 12. So if you have your Bible with you, feel free to read along. I think mo I'm, I'm, I have the New King James Version. I think most versions get this right. It's funny, I, I heard a story on YouTube, or I watched a story on YouTube about how the communist government in China is redoing the Bible. It, it was kind of a shocking story, and one example they gave, gave of this was the time that uh, the, the Jewish uh, priest brought, brought a, an adulterous woman to the synagogue and where Christ was. And of course Christ knelt down in the dirt and began to write whatever he was writing. It was sufficient to get them to disperse. I guess he, 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 he guilted them and made them rethink what they were doing because neither of them are worthy. And anyway, that's a beautiful story, but the ending that they put on the story um, is that Jesus stoned her himself, which is absolutely ridiculous. So the Bible is truth, but we have to know what, version, what, Bible, what the Bible is and what is the true word of God. That is not the true word of God. So anyway, join me now. This uh, picture I have is probably a representation of what it might have been like when uh, Christ, when Jesus did the Sermon on the Mount, beautiful, sunny day, light breeze. He probably sat on the higher portion of the ground, uh, and then the disciples and, and the multitude were told, gathered around. And seeing the multitude, he went up on the mountain. And when he was seated, the disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed, blessed are those who hunger, there's the hunger, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. So these first four reflect our love of God and, and our being drawn to God toward salvation and on our path to sanctification. The next four more so reflect our love for others and attitudes we can have to help further us um, showing that love to, to others around us, which we need to do as Christians. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the poor of heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake for being right with God, right? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake, Jesus says. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were brought, who were before you. So you're in good company if you get to that that stage. So here they are in um, a pictorial form. But before I begin, or sorry, continue, uh, I'm just going to bow my head in prayer. Maybe you could join me. Gracious Father, your Sabbath day is a day set aside, sanctified, and made holy by you. One beautiful day a week of total rest in you, our creator and our redeemer. We ask that the Holy Spirit be with us today as we praise you and explore your character through your son, Jesus, as we recall his words from the Sermon on the Mount. May my words be acceptable to you. 
and may my words be yours, Father. Please guide me, your will, not ours, be done. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So all these Beatitudes start with a blessing and they end with some sort of a reward. And the word blessed means happy, right? So you're probably asking, what is Jesus really saying here? So is he saying happy are the unhappy, right? Because that's how we look at some of these uh, attitudes, right? Being meek, being um, merciful sometimes. People look down on that in our society. And in fact, the Pharisees who may have been there and actually listening, they probably stood in the back. They didn't want to get too close to show that they actually were interested. But they were far enough away back not to be associated with Christ, but close enough, I would guess, so that people see their head shaking and their finger wagging and their disappointing glances. Um, now, not all Pharisees, I'm sure, were like that, but we have this uh, image from the New Testament, don't we? I'm sure they weren't all like that. I'm sure many came to Christ and loved him, and many will, I pray, or everybody in the world. Well, it turns out if we listen to Jesus' words as if spoken by God, because he is God, keep that in mind as we go through this, if we listen to these words as spoken by God to us in this fallen world, then yes, he is essentially saying we will be happy if we adopt these attitudes. Living like this, like Jesus did, will mean everlasting happiness for each and every one of us. This world is fleeting. We need to focus on where true happiness is, and that's with Christ in eternity. It's all through the Bible. It's a fact. It's going to happen. Now, this is a tough sell, perhaps, to people in the world, you know, with both feet firmly on the, on the world or in the world. But it's quite intriguing, I think, for us who are seeking spiritual richness in Jesus and in God. Um, so it's, these are a guide of sorts. That's how I, I look at them, how they are to be taken. Okay. So from our reading today, we saw... That Jesus read, uh, that we saw Jesus read or heard of read, Jesus reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 61, verse 1, and in his hometown. So, this is a verse written hundreds of years before his birth. And this, as well as chapter 53 in the book of Isaiah and other verses, um, describe a Messiah, Messiah that's very different than that who was expected by the Jewish people of his day, right? The, the suffering servant. Messiah, the, the humble healer. That's Christ's true nature, isn't it? But the Jewish people had been enslaved by Babylon, Medo-Persia, then conquered by Greece, and then by Rome. So they, they were fed up, right? And we all know these stories from the book of Daniel, or this history from the book of Daniel, and also from our history books, the two coincide. The Bible is truth, predicts um, history, and is consistent with it or I should say the history is consistent with the Bible, which is the word of God. So they said, the Jews said, this is enough, right? We've had it, right? And they completely overlooked the suffering servant and they went straight for the conquering king stuff, right? They wanted a savior who was gonna come and release them from their bondage to other people in this world. But that's not, well, while Jesus was doing, going to do that or is doing that, it was in a very different way than they had anticipated, right? So they had missed the significance of Daniel's 70-week prophecy, which perfectly predicted Jesus' coming, his anointing, and his death. Right? They weren't ready. Rather than let the Bible speak truth to them, the Jews of Jesus' day focused their hope on the conquering Messiah. They weren't ready for Jesus' first coming. They wanted to throw him off a cliff, as you recall, um, when he read from Isaiah 61.1, and that was in his hometown, no less. Can you imagine? What a, what a welcoming. So do we let the Bible speak its truth to us today, or are we in a similar boat? You know, we, we certainly try not to be, right? Are we any more ready to receive Jesus when he comes again the next time? No wonder Jesus entered his mission preaching the Beatitudes, a sermon that likewise did not fit the expectations of, of his day. It's no shock to us that Jesus preached the Beatitudes after he 
preached some, the ser sermon uh, 61 1 in Isaiah. They're very similar in flavor, right? Jesus did not conquer in a spiritual sense, or sorry, did conquer in a spiritual sense, uh, versus, say, a physical sense with spears and arrows. So he did conquer in a spiritual sense. But he might take exception to me saying that, I would think. He could potentially do that. And why? Well, think about it. He died a most humble death on the cross, very physical, excruciating death. He died for the sins of all the world, and he completely conquered death and his enemy when he rose on the third day. Bible fact. Yes, it was an absolute victory. It was real. No worldly superpower was annihilated in a great battle, but one was defeated, and, he, and, and we, his children, were lifted up to the cross. It was a spiritual and in every sense a physical victory also. Recall John 3.16, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted, that everyone who believes may have eternal life. And of course, John 3.16, which was from the same conversation with Nicodemus that Jesus had, remember, at one night. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have eternal, everlasting life. Most of the world didn't notice at the time that Jesus had won on the cross. In fact, to many it looked like, like a defeat. So Ellen White, in Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, basically is saying that if all we have was this sermon that, that Christ spoke or preached, the Sermon on the Mount, we'd have more than enough to be saved. With this sermon, Jesus is introducing himself to his people, to us, to the entire world, all of humanity. What a beautiful introduction it is. This is no simple sermon meant to stay within the confines of political correctness. No, this sermon is revolutionary. Jesus was revolutionary trying to take us out of this world, right? He has very different attitudes and views on, on life because of his connection with the Father, which he's calling us to have also. Jesus is challenging current cultural authority with these seemingly benign phrases, right? Blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, blessed are the merciful, for example. No, this is big. Picture it. The eternal creator and lawgiver Jesus Christ shocks the world. Here we are 2,000 years later still talking about this beautiful sermon by the most beautiful preacher ever to walk the earth. God himself. This is God, right? Remember that. These are the words of God made flesh. This is God speaking to us. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was here, and, there are, and these are some of the mind-blowing things that he taught, we are told. For he taught them as one having authority, not as one of the scribes. And at the time, that, that was huge. What a compliment, because for the people of the day, the scribes were the intelligentsia, the, bright, the brightest, right? The, the ones who had ascended to the pinnacle of success. And here, we're told that he taught with greater authority than they had. Right? He wasn't taught in, in the synagogue formally as they were, but he certainly was taught um, the word of God. He is God. He was taught uh, by, from God the Father himself. Amen. <clears throat> so what is God telling us here with these Beatitudes? It seems to me it just might be important important to us who navigate this fallen world, and we forget that sometimes, all right? We're, we're in this world of deception. This isn't reality in, in a godly sense, right? This is just the path we are on since the fall in Eden, and this is a way Christ is beckoning us to the finish line to be with him, right? He gives us a set of attitudes here or principles reflecting his own character, 
principles we will develop in our walk with him as we go through that sanctification process. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, taught that one must work his way to God and that they were the pinnacle of this ascent. Just look at us, they would exclaim. You know, not all of them again. I don't want to make that point. Um, but they looked down on poverty and illness as sins against God and uncleanliness. They looked down on the, the lowly in spirit, those humble who lack greatness, worldly greatness. Does that sound familiar? It certainly does to me. We hear that all the time today. We have the, the world preaches the exact same values. We have to step back and reevaluate it. And I think we talked about it in Sabbath school. We have to adjust um, how we are in the world as Christians, right? Um, because it's, it's, we need to be a little different than everybody else. The Pharisees equated worldly success with godliness and illness with sin. Jesus agreed with neither of these. Recall the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. I've got a little picture of it up there. <clears throat> this expressed the feeling of the Pharisee class at that time and probably in large part the nation of Israel um, during that part of history, right? The Pharisees stood in the front of the synagogue as if saying, look at me and my great stature, my wonderful garments, how colorful. I am so right with God, All right? They probably glanced back, or he probably glanced back, back over his shoulder smugly as he prayed, God, thank you that I am not as the rest of men. Clearly unfamiliar with the Beatitudes, meekness or spiritual poorness. Does this man sound like he requires a savior? No, right? If you think like that, you're, you're, you feel like, I can do this on my own. I don't need a savior. I can work my way to heaven. He doesn't to me. So an entry-level attitude to enter into the kingdom, kingdom is spiritual um, uh, weakness or loss. We, we need to be empty, right? So he glanced at the humble, spiritually empty tax collector in the back of the synagogue, right? Because he was meek and lowly of spirit. And that's what we need in order to really get close with God, right? To begin that sanctification process. And he had his head in his hands and he was on step one of these beatitudes. As he prayed, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He knew his sinful nature. Now this man knows he requires a savior, doesn't he? Jesus came shattering the values of most priests of the day. Come to me, ye that are heavy laden, and, give, and I will give you rest. Come to me, he says, you who are weak, helpless, and despairing. Come and I will save you. You know, but who was he? to put such qualities such as money, you know, power and strength and success behind these qualities, right? Who was he to upturn the apple cart? <clears throat> these are all things the world promotes. I kind of like this picture. Um, so Jesus broke down the myths of his time, right? For example, in Luke 5, 12, he touched the leper breaking all social norms, showing that the leprous man was not bad, he wasn't immoral, not wicked, but in need of healing, as we all are, in, other, in different ways perhaps. Although there is an outbreak of uh, leprosy in Florida, I heard, so maybe there's some lepers around. But in need of healing. So in Jesus' purity, he could offer this healing to that man. He didn't even have to touch him. Jesus could have made this happen with no contact at all because he's God, right? He could have sat in Capernaum with feet up at Peter's house and healed every leper that walked the earth. But what would be the point of that, right? They need to be drawn to the Savior and to God, and that's what Jesus did. He broke down these barriers that kept other people away from these sick individuals, whether you're spiritually sick or whether you're physically sick. And the leper said, I know you can heal me if you are willing. He too was breaking social norms by approaching Christ, right? 
What an act of faith. And in fact, most of the healings, right, we need to see an act of faith from the healed um, to accept Christ and accept that he is capable of this and that he is God. And because the lepers at the time had to be outside the city and whenever someone approached, they had to, you know, alert them. They had to say, I'm unclean, I'm unclean, I'm unclean, stay away. Like, can you imagine the humiliation? You're sick and then you have to do this. You know, you're alienated. I think you're looked after by people who knew you or through begging. It was awful. I am willing, Jesus said. Imagine that leprous man having felt that humility and persecution from all around him. Jesus said, I'm willing. Right? Isn't that the most beautiful thing you could hear? I am willing. I see you when no one else does. I recognize you as mine. I heal you and make you whole as you should be, as you were in Eden and will be again. We all will be. Leave, uh, I love you, he said, and sin no more. It's always associated with um, repenting and turning from sin. That's what we're called to do. The Beatitudes talk about attitudes for salvation and who better to tell us than the Messiah himself, right? The Son of God made flesh. Jesus is our mediator and our judge. So we can look at this sermon as a way to structure our lives, to ready ourselves for the kingdom of God, which he rules over. I don't know about you, but every time I see Jesus' words in the Bible, in a lot of Bibles, they're red, not in mine, but they can be. I think... You know, I, I, I sit up and I take, lit, I take notice and I think, well, what's Jesus trying to tell me here? And it's the truth, same with the Sermon on the Mount. He actually preached these words, right? <clears throat> well, the Sermon on the Mount, just before Christ picks his 12 apostles, can tell us a whole lot. Jesus had only months before been baptized, right, in the River Jordan by John, John the Baptist. And he began his ministry at that point, uh, just as the 70-week prophecy had told us so he's on a mission now right to save humanity maybe we should listen maybe what we need are these attitudes right to to bring us to salvation blessed are the poor in spirit the kingdom of heaven is theirs how is being poor a blessing you might ask don't some preachers tell us that you know we'll be financially blessed if we believe in jesus that's the whole um, there's a whole movement now where, where people are trying to get um, individuals into the church, promising them great money and wealth. That's not Jesus. Not that he can't do that. He certainly can. He did it for Job, right? He doubled his wealth or multi multiplied it multiple times. But that's not the essence. That's not what should bring us into church, I guess I'm trying to say. So Jesus is contrasting this world with eternity, right? A lasting kingdom, not a fleeting existence. It's tempting to want to focus on what's in front of us, but Jesus is saying, no, no, focus on me. Look at me. Said another way, blessed are those who realize their spiritual bankruptcy, right? I'm empty, Lord. Please fill me. You only need a savior when you realize you cannot do it on your own. When you surrender your pride and ask Jesus for help, The people gathered on the hillside listening to the sermon from Jesus must have done a double take. Maybe they scratched their heads. Perhaps they asked the neighbor, they bumped the guy, said, you know, did, did I hear him right? You know, did he say, blessed are the poor of spirit? But isn't it blessed are those who are great? Maybe at first this was quite confusing to people of Jesus' day. Recall in Luke 5, Peter sees the miracle of the fish. Jesus told him to cast his net after a night of failed fishing. He reluctantly did. He was tired. They were all tired. And they pulled up over 300 fish and tore their net, in fact. So Peter said, depart from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. He expected Christ to, to leave, but he didn't, right? He won't leave. We may leave him, but he will never leave us. Christ welcomed Peter's humility and acknowledgement that he was spiritually lost. That's what we all need to come to Christ with, with this attitude. This is the first step 
in the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Again, what did he say, right? Mourners are blessed. But yes, Jesus says those who mourn will be comforted by him. Those who mourn over sin, whether their own or the sin around them and from others, society, Jesus will comfort us. Daniel in 9.20 says, I went on praying, confessing my sins and the sins of my people, Israel, and pleading with the Lord. This is mournfulness. God hears our disgust and frustration. He's disgusted too. He can't live with sin. This doesn't refer to worldly mourning, though. For example, if you have disappointment over a failed ambition or aspiration to power or desire for gain, right? These are not what are referred to in these Beatitudes. Grief over these are not really what the Beatitudes reflect. Despair for these reasons can lead to spiritual lows, lack of will to live, and even suicide in the extreme. This does not reflect God's character. He's calling us to focus on him instead. Don't go down that path. Forget those things. They don't matter. We're not to be consumed by these things, but yes, it's difficult because we live here, we live in this world, and we have to survive. Jesus, however, is saying, don't worry, just focus on me, not the world. Judas Iscariot is a great example of this. He betrayed Jesus for gain, for the 30 pieces of silver, and then he hung himself out of guilt. He should have kept his eyes on Christ, so he's an example of falling so far from so he was with Christ. Some mourning can be beneficial if it's accompanied by a firm basis in God with faith and hope in him. Jesus himself wept, you recall, over Lazarus, right? When he, I know and he even took his time getting back, but he was still quite mournful over the loss of his friend. He was human in, in, on this earth. God made human. It's a tough concept, but that's, that's what it was. That's what he was. Jesus certainly knows the pain of loss and understands our losses in this world, and we all have them. It's, it's human. We all live and we all die. We watch others die. He is mourning with us. Blessed are those who hunger after and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Jesus hungered to do his Father's will. John 3, uh, sorry, 4, 3, 4. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. That was what Christ focused on. And he wants us to focus on the same thing, right? Follow God. We also, as Jesus, are to hunger and thirst as if starving sometimes. And we want to be right with him. Matthew 5, 20, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, remember the intelligent people, the ones everyone looked up to at the time, unless your righteousness surpasses those, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So these were, I mean, imagine, these must have been horrifying words to the lowly disciples, right, who were fishermen and, and, and you know, servants in the community. And they had been taught that this group of people was above them, that they were at the top of that pecking order to get into the gates of heaven. But don't panic, the Pharisees were great at walking the walk, but not so good at the spiritual intent of obedience to God. Right? They added lots of silly ordinances and made it impossible to worship on the Sabbath, for example. God will bless us if we're in a personal relationship with him and if we obey him. Blessed are those who show mercy, for mercy will be shown to them. No one has ever been as merciful as Christ, for God did not send his Son into the world to condemn it, but so that the world might be saved through him. I mean, when he comes again, it's going to be as a judging in judgment, uh, but he came to lead us through this haze of deception in this world, to get us back to Eden. Jesus, through the Beatitudes, is giving us principles or attitudes by which to live, by which to demonstrate in our lives the character of Jesus and God himself. Didn't Jesus live these attitudes? Yes, he did. By living them, then, aren't we displaying the faith of Christ? And remember Revelation 14, 12, 
Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. These attitudes are part of the faith of Jesus. So this is what we strive for. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. This beatitude ties purity of heart with access to the kingdom of God and the prospect of actually seeing God. That's the reward attached to this blessing from the mouth of God, so you can believe it. So what is this purity? Because we want it, right? I know I do. Who wouldn't jump at a chance to see God? Psalm 24, 3, 4 reflects this beatitude well. Who shall ascend into the hill? What hill? God's kingdom, right? Purity is the basic requirement for citizens of heaven. Do you get this point? Because it's, it's kind of important, right? We need to really cling to Jesus just as Jacob did on the night that they wrestled, right? Without Jesus, we have no hope of a pure heart. We can't do that on our own. I, I can, for sure. To get into his kingdom, we must not be vain, but are wrapped up in ourselves. And perhaps the opposite of this is probably true also, right? We must be more wrapped up in other people. Nor sworn deceitfully, it goes on, right? Liars have no place in the kingdom. Do these things and receive blessings, God is saying. Proverb 4.23, give us an idea what we must do. Guard your heart. It puts... <clears throat> it goes on to say, put away from you deceitful mouth, again, avoiding the lies, and put away perverse lips. There's no need for gossip or um, to speak in a way that probably Christ wouldn't. It goes on, let your eyes look straight ahead, ponder the path of your feet, remove your foot from evil. It takes a conscious effort to avoid pitfalls. Just as Peter focused on Christ, or didn't focus on Christ when he was attempting to walk on water, on the Sea of Galilee, remember he's saying, if, he would, if we are to focus on Christ, maybe that will keep us afloat in this world. Was Jesus pure of heart? He sure was, right? And we, we are called by faith to walk with him in the Holy Spirit to attain his character, which we are incapable of attaining ourselves. Perhaps one of the most salient lessons that we learn from these Beatitudes is that we can't save ourselves, right? This is throughout the entire Bible. We need to get that. We have to be drawn to Christ, run to Christ. We have to recognize that we are lost and in need of Jesus. This is an essential step which we must acknowledge to attain salvation. The Beatitudes then are in a sense steps to salvation, steps that we must take, right? From one through nine. From realizing our spiritual bankruptcy to being prepared to be persecuted in the other extreme. Why? Because we know that true life is not here, but in eternity with Christ. This seventh beatitude addresses peace between all inhabitants on this planet, between all of us. Right? That's important. They're all important. How do we think we're doing on this, this peace Beatitude, right? Probably not so well if you watch the news. As a, as a global community, I think there's so many wars going on and so much strife, um, and even locally you can see that perhaps it's, it's a challenge for most of us to do in our, our human nature, right? We need to remember that peace, though, is a gift from God. Uh, just, you know, just as we can't be saved by ourselves, we need God to help us attain his peace. It's a different peace than we see in the world. In John 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. So don't fear, have peace in me. No matter what's going on, be peace at peace. I'm with you. Here Jesus is telling us that in me you will have true peace. Not just the peace that we get in this world, the peace brother, right, that kind of thing, but peace that will allow us who believe in Jesus to be calm in the most fearful events, perhaps even remain at peace in the midst of suffering. Didn't Paul sing aloud when he was in the prisons? He sing, he sing praises to God, right? That's certainly an extreme, but, and many people who were persecuted, there are lots of stories of 
people doing the same thing, singing aloud, praising God, even when at the stake. Hard to imagine. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are righteous by faith in Jesus. The rebellion between us and God is over. There is no more rebellion with God. We should have peace with God. He is our God and we are his people. That's our covenant, right? What is a peacemaker? That's kind of a tough one, right? It's not the politician who gets on and says, oh, look, I'm, I'm a peacemaker. Or, look what I did, right? He probably hasn't gone through any of the other steps in the Beatitudes. That's not really what I think Christ intended it to be. We are peacemakers if we, by action of word, lead someone away from sin and to the love of Jesus. We don't have to rush to the scene of a brawl, perhaps the side of the road downtown when you're out for a drive, and, and jump in the midst of two guys brawling, these flailing fists everywhere. We don't have to do that to be considered peacemakers. Luckily, who wants to do that? But actually, which is more difficult to do? I think the words from the book Thoughts from the Blessing on the Mount by Ellen White are far more difficult than to just jump into front of, in between a couple of guys to get the designation of peacemaker. Christ's followers are sent to the world with the message of peace. Whoever by quiet, unconscious influence of a holy life shall reveal the love of Christ. Whoever by word or deed shall lead another to renounce sin and yield his heart to God is a peacemaker. What I think this is saying is that we have to have a character of peace and live this in an unconscious way as we go through life. This, this, this character should be automatic for us, right, and draw others to us. These beatitudes are a direct rebuke to Satan. This is Jesus saying to him, you are nothing like me and my church. Jesus is saying, your time grows short. These, are, these and the law of God, right, the commandments, are a safety rope through the storm. That's how I see it. Right? These attitudes are a reflection of the character of God and they are a reflection of Jesus and his character. Who is God? Didn't he say, I and the Father are one? He did. No, this is not some quaint sermon by Jesus, but a message directly from the mouth of God made flesh to guide us out of the world soaked in sin. It was a massive shock to the people of his day, and it's a shock to us today if we have our feet planted in the world, right? I mean, spiritually away from God. It would be quite a shock. We all thought we had it figured out. We are to work hard, get ahead, however we can, and we are to be winners, not weak, right? Isn't that what society emphasizes? It sure does. No, none of this matters to God. He wants us to recognize our natures, come to Jesus with repentant and contrite hearts, to let go of all pride and surrender ourselves to him, to the kingdom of God in every way. And when we do this, have the attitude showing we are lowly, poor of spirit, mournful of the world's sin and our own, humble as Christ is humble, seeking his righteousness, merciful to others as Jesus was merciful to others, turning the cheek literally, as he goes on to say actually uh, just after this. Peace, <clears throat> peaceful and peacemakers, right? Ignoring things that normally tick us off. Tough to do, but we need to remember this, to rein it in, right? We need to walk with Christ and develop these attitudes then just maybe when we do all that, right, we will be so noticeable and stand out so much on the background of this world, right, that, that we may be persecuted for our love of Christ, as many have been in the past. Of course, we're not all called to, to go through that experience, thank God, but that in an extreme, if you love Jesus, you will gladly do. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteous, 
for our righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Is there much persecution today? Certainly in pockets of the world there is, but really not a lot around this neck of the woods here. Your neighbor not liking you because you're a vegetarian and you won't go out for Friday burgers probably doesn't qualify for persecution. But the Waldensians, on the other hand, and other groups that were persecuted during the Dark Ages, they uh, truly underwent persecution. And men, women, and children were hurled off cliffs um, where they, were, they fleed to to get away from the, the Roman, um, or yes, from the Rome, Roman church. And they, were, they died for love of Christ, right? Love of the Bible, love of his word. Christianity, is, there's no doubt, Christianity is countercultural uh, today, right? It's not walking with typical culture. We are, people uh, do not see Christians as being in this world or um, equal to this world. And that's a good thing. And that's what we're called to demonstrate. To worship God, we may be called upon to endure spiritual, emotional, and physical stress. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. This blessing is, only, is the only one of the nine that's expressed in the second person. Right here, Christ is saying, uh, speaking directly to us and as his disciples. And it gets better, right? Because Christ is saying, with this blessing, the reward um, uh, will be that we will uh, be great in, in heaven. Our reward in heaven will be great. So um, that's the benefit of standing with Christ. There's not a lot of overt persecution in North America yet. And why not? Could it be that the son of perdition is actually happy with us? Is Laodicea lukewarm about their walk with Jesus? Are we too comfortable with our lives? You know, maybe we think all oh, this is way too hard. All right, summary slide. So there's an intentionality here to the Beatitudes that sometimes we don't always see as we go from, read from one to the other, right? But that order does matter. Before God, we are empty and we mourn sin. We, we humbly submit to God. We thirst and hunger to be right with him. We begin to fill up now and in the overflow, we begin to show mercy to others to develop pure hearts thoughts and behaviors. We reconcile with others. We turn to the other cheek. Right? We, we ask forgiveness um, of those we've offended. And this so ticks off the rest of the world that we would gladly suffer for Jesus' sake if necessary. In so doing this, we may bring others to him. Right? The early Christian church, as I said, did exactly this. As they were persecuted and murdered, many, many more came. Last slide. So God gave his people the Ten Commandments through Moses on Mount Sinai. Jesus, God made flesh, gave his people the Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount. The Beatitudes then can be thought of as the law of God with a new dimension, right? These attitudes reflect the character of God. They reflect the two tablets of the law. Here are attitudes to reflect the love that we have for God, vertical, right? And the love we have for others. So again, shop, cross shape, horizontally. We can look at these as commands in a sense, right? Each blessing has a promise attached to it. The kingdom of heaven will be yours. You will see God, for example. Then perhaps not adopting these attitudes will not yield these blessings in our lives or these promises. In this sense, it's in our interest to adopt these attitudes, but only out of love for Jesus and others. It won't work if we are void of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, your word is a lamp to my, our feet and a light to our path. Thank you that we have your truth and light to guide us. These beatitudes from the mouth of Jesus, your son, 
are a call to follow him and share his faith. May these attitudes and words you shared today dwell in our hearts and move us to action. We ask this in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. We'll stand as we sing our closing hymn, O Master, Let Me Walk With Thee, number 574. <laughs> Father, thank you for revealing your love and beautiful character to us today through the Beatitudes. If it's your will, please depart with each of us in the power of the Holy Spirit. May you bless us and keep us. May your face shine upon us. Please always be with us and give us your peace. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you.